Um, so I've been asked to talk about uh, how we use fetal echocardiography uh, for delivery planning for fetuses with congenital heart disease. Uh, my objectives will be to first highlight the importance of perinatal and delivery room planning on outcome in newborns diagnosed prenatally. Then we'll review some fetal echo findings that enable prediction of risk for compromise at delivery or in the neonatal period um, for newborns with heart disease. And then finally, discuss delivery management strategies, and I'll introduce some protocols that are newly published um, for newborns with specific congenital heart disease. So in the modern era, we now have diagnostic precision uh, with state-of-the-art testing to better define cardiac anatomy. Um, it enables us also to acquire hemodynamic information to assess not only heart function, but just overall fetal cardiovascular status. And now we um, have really started to use in utero follow-up protocols to assess progression of disease. Overall, our goal, uh, all of us, is to improve outcomes beyond our current practice. There are fetal care options, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, but also uh, delivery room and neonatal management options, uh, which I think we all have access to, uh, that will enable us to create specialized transitional care protocols uh, and plan therapies for cardiac interventions that happen soon after birth. So the big question for those of us who do this is always, do we make a difference? Does fetal diagnosis improve outcome? And unfortunately, some studies suggest that there may even be a worse outcome after the fetal diagnosis of congenital heart disease. But when you look at it, those, these studies are mostly limited by their methodology with the fetal diagnosis groups having more severe diagnoses, and oftentimes terminations are counted as death. In the postnatal diagnosis groups, uh, what it's hard to get a handle on is deaths that occur in the local delivery hospital or at home. Um, this study, which is the Epicard study out of Paris, looking at 354 newborns, there was a prenatal diagnosis in 95% of the single ventricles, 71% of the transpositions, 68% TETS, and 43% carcation. And what this study showed was uh, on first look, no difference in mortality risk for prenatal versus postnatal diagnosis with really a risk ratio of one. Uh, and then breaking it down into subgroups, no difference in association between the risk of mortality and prenatal diagnosis of, across these four subgroups of single ventricles, transposition, tetralogy, and coarctation. Um, however, I'd like to draw your attention to transposition of the great arteries, where actually, even though it was not statistically significant, you were twice as likely um, to die if you were uh, diagnosed postnatally. In India, which um, is really obviously a different population um, and a, a different things to deal with as babies are born with congenital heart disease, uh, in this study, there were 119 um, patients with critical heart disease and a prenatal diagnosis and about a third. There was 10% mortality in this group, nine of those dying preoperatively. And so this is really what we as the fetal doctors wanna hone in on is who dies even before surgery. If you look at the prenatal diagnosis group versus the postnatal, that's what uh, these graphs show. The PRAC score shows better preoperative hemodynamic status in the prenatally diagnosed group versus the postnatal. And then the transport risk index showed a lower transport risk uh, index of stability uh, in those diagnosed prenatally. Uh, early cardiac procedures uh, in the prenatal group, which uh, some new evidence uh, looking at neurodevelopmental outcomes suggests that if you do the surgery sooner, you have better neuro outcomes. Uh, and then if we just look strictly at these uh, single patients that died uh, preoperatively, there was um, a lower preoperative mortality in those diagnosed prenatally with only uh, two dying in the prenatally diagnosed group versus 10% in the postnatal group. And then looking specifically in those that were diagnosed postnatally, um, seven uh, out of those 10 deaths were due to suboptimal preoperative status, which precluded surgery. So if you look here at the reasons, most of them 
included multi-organ damage, um, ventricular dysfunction, hypoxic, hypoxic ischemic injury. So this to me suggests that what we do does matter um, in that we uh, sort of get babies to our hospitals uh, in a better preoperative situation. This meta-analysis of over 1,300 patients with 22% diagnosed prenatally, again, on first pass for all comers should mortality be higher in the prenatal group, almost double 10% versus 5%. But the authors certainly acknowledge that the fetal patients included higher risk diagnoses as well as determination. And what I think is important that they noted was the fetal diagnosis did not assure optimal postnatal care. So it's not just about making the diagnosis, but then what do you do after? And then with the secondary analysis that included the patients with a standard risk and intent to treat, as well as what they defined as optimal care, the mortality was in fact lower in the prenatally diagnosed group, looking at the individual studies, uh, which are the squares, but also overall for the combined group. So this then leads us, leads me to uh, say that it's not just the diagnosis of congenital heart disease in utero, but how we manage them starting uh, in the delivery room. So let's think about this. Here's the fetal circulation. I'm sure everybody's seen this cartoon. Um, the circulation obviously allows for the mixing of this red blood coming from the placenta to streamline across the foramen ovale to reach the body. And then we have the ductus arteriosus which allows that blood, uh, blue blood to return to the placenta. Um, so what happens in the postnatal period and what do we have to think about as we transition? Well, first is the initiation of respiration and ventilation. There needs to be a patent airway, the lungs need to expand. And this definitely is the expertise of our neonatal colleagues. Um, however, just as important is the change in the circulation and the hemodynamics that come with being born First off, there's closure of the fetal shunt pathways. The frame and ovale closes right in the delivery room. But there's also an increase in the systemic vascular resistance with cord clamping. And there should be a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance with that first breath. So if the congenital heart defect is dependent on any of these things um, or is affected in a negative way with that transition, we do have to think about specialized delivery room and neonatal care. Um, so, delivery room and transitional care, what are our goals? Again, to improve outcomes, and the outcome starts with an accurate diagnosis, fetal care uh, when necessary, and then this successful transition. And I started uh, thinking about this in 2004 when I arrived at Children's and noticed that there wasn't a delivery room that I could easily access. And so, what we did was to create protocols um, for transitional care risk based on these fetal echo, fetal echo findings that we could identify and um, categorize patients on a scale of one to four using evidence-based medicine when available, expert consensus when that data wasn't available, and then our delivery plans are based on this assignment. So this has been published. Um, we've studied it prospectively uh, and published our results in 2013. Uh, and then again in 2015, um, showing that it does work. And then it became part of the HA scientific statement that was published in 2014. And so basically one to four, uh, one are those where there's no instability expected. These are the low risk congenital heart defects that can deliver at the local hospital. The um, level two are the medium risk. We expect them to be stable in the delivery room, but something needs to happen before they go home. These are usually the ductal dependent lesions. And then the threes, high risk, and fours, really high risk. Uh, in centers that have uh, a delivery room right in their hospital, these can sometimes be put together, but certainly these are the diagnoses in which cardiology presence and specialized care uh, is useful to improve outcomes. The high-risk diagnoses, the threes and fours, uh, are listed here, and this is, again, from uh, uh, one of our first papers in 2013. We're going to talk about these diagnoses, what to look for to categorize them, and then, importantly, what happens after that when you identify this high-risk situation. So let's start with some examples. 
<laughs> this is an atrioventricular canal defect. Obviously, you can see the middle of the heart is missing here. We've got a big BSD, a big ASD, and a single valve. The color shows no AV valve regurgitation and not really much flow across the holes. This is a serious congenital heart defect. Um, however, this patient is not going to be uh, unstable in the delivery room, is not going to be unstable in the nursery, and probably not for the first two to three weeks of life. So this is a level one uh, delivery, which um, the diagnosis can be confirmed and outpatient follow-up arranged. Interestingly, truncus, uh, four chambers here, normal four chamber view, um, why this is often missed. Uh, however, sweeping up towards the outflow tract, there's only a single valve here. This is one that has truncal insufficiency. You can see the branch pulmonary artery is coming off and then the aorta um, and the pulmonary artery are one big uh, truncal outflow. So this is a serious heart defect. It does require usually repair within the first week or two of life. However, this is also a level one delivery because we do not expect instability in the delivery room or even in the first days of life. Tetralogy of Fallot, the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect that we take care of. Again, the four chamber view is normal. However, as you start to sweep up towards the outflow tract, you can see the hole starting to appear. And then when you get up here towards the left ventricular outflow tract in the aorta, you can see it's overriding with a big ventricular septal defect. Now, sweeping up to the pulmonary, you can see that this valve isn't normal. Um, it's smaller than it should be. It looks stenotic. So there is tetralogy. But the question is, is this going to be a pink tet, meaning the oxygen level is adequate and elective repair, or a blue tet in which prostaglandin is needed? So is this a level one? or a level two um, prostaglandin and transfer delivery. But well, looking into the literature, there's multiple studies that uh, are single center retrospective studies that tell us we can look at the pulmonary valve Z-score, particularly in the third trimester, and the flow pattern in the ductus that's really gonna give us an idea of where we're gonna fall, pink or blue, um, stable in the neonatal period or need for uh, neonatal surgery. Um, it's the ductus that we found to be most useful in our prospective look. As you can see, this little red jet here is reverse flow in the ductus arteriosus from aorta to pulmonary artery. And so just this little color jet here turns this patient from a level one to a level two prostaglandin and need for transfer. Tricuspid atresia, single ventricle. There's the aorta coming off. You can see the right ventricle is small. There's no tricuspid valve. But just like the tetralogies, when we're looking at right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, it's the ductal flow pattern that tells us what needs to happen. Uh, and even though these pictures aren't the greatest, uh, you can see this little red jet here, the reverse flow in the ductus, tells us that this is a single ventricle patient that will, in fact, need prostaglandin and transfer. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, again, another single ventricle, more uh, pretty easy to diagnose. Obviously, the four chamber views is abnormal with a small left ventricle. Uh, and then when we go to the arch, this is sternum and this is spine, you can see this red here is reverse flow in the transverse arch that's coming from the ductus. So reverse flow in the aorta says that this is a ductal dependent systemic blood flow lesion. It's obviously a level two prostaglandin transfer need for neonatal surgery. But interestingly, in about 5 to 10% of these um, patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, there's an additional feature of a restrictive or closed foramen ovale, which sometimes is hard to tell when you're looking at the atrial septum. As you can see here, there's some blue color swirling around, but it's hard to tell if that's crossing, if it's open, if it's big enough. And so does this patient um, need just prostaglandin and a transfer or something um, more to open up that atrial septum soon after birth. So again, looking to the literature, there are several retrospective studies out there that tell us to look towards the pulmonary vein Doppler um, to predict the need for atrial septoplasty. And it's this pattern down here with the forward and reverse flow that tells us that something will need to be done, that this baby is going to have um, pulmonary venous congestion that results in hypoxia and acidosis soon after birth. So this particular patient had this 
spiky back and forth flow pattern and obviously is a level four delivery. So what do we do about it? Um, the goal is to get that atrial septum open. And so this is this kid. Um, we went straight from the delivery room to the cath lab. And what you can see is really there's no atrial septal opening. Um, balloon catheters can be used. This is a catheter that has little microblades on the outside. The septum needed to be open with a radio frequency catheter to burn a hole in the atrial septum. Uh, and then using, this is the echo probe and fluoroscopy, you can see this cutting balloon uh, is inflated in the atrial septum, um, allowing then egress of pulmonary venous blood from the left atrium. Okay, moving on to TAPVR. There are four subtypes. Most of us know that the infradiaphragmatic subtype is uh, most often associated with obstructed flow. Uh, here's an example of uh, total veins. This uh, red is the vein coming in to the left atrium or in the region of the left atrium, sternum and spine. But instead of making it there, it descends, goes below the diaphragm and inserts here uh, into the systemic venous system below the diaphragm. Not all infradiaphragmatic veins become obstructed. And similarly, not all supracardiac veins um, are unobstructed. And that is the big um, branch point, whereas uh, unobstructed veins can be repaired electively and obstructed veins will get very sick soon after birth. So how do we tell which is it? Uh, again, looking to the literature, it's pulmonary venous flow that tells us which veins are likely to get obstructed, and it is D here with this continuous low velocity flow that seems to be associated with compromise. That's what this patient had, so this is a level four. Uh, Epstein's anomaly, another complicated, terrible disease. If it's severe, this is an example. Um, here is the chest. The heart fills the chest. You can see it's all right atrium with severe tricuspid regurgitation. The mortality overall is high, uh, including in utero. But if you get out of the neonatal period, the survival is improved. Um, there are a series of papers coming from a multi-center study that um, was led by the Boston group that tell us what to look for um, for morbidity and mortality, certainly high drops but there are features to look for, a big heart, the size of the tricuspid valve annulus, but also uh, how well the right ventricle is working. And then interestingly, this presence of no anti-grade pulmonary blood flow and pulmonary insufficiency. Uh, this uh, is certainly a level three, four delivery. These babies are sick in utero. They're gonna be sick in the delivery room hearts fill the chest, uh, and these kids are very difficult to manage. So what can we do? Um, well, if you can get them uh, to uh, a reasonable gestational age, it's important to uh, pay attention to how you're going to ventilate. Uh, most of these kids will do better if you start by intubating and paralyzing um, with then efforts to drop the pulmonary resistance if that pulmonary valve is open um, by using oxygen, considering nitric oxide, but being very cautious uh, about left ventricular function because often that can be diminished as well. Now, if the pulmonary valve is open with pulmonary insufficiency, you wanna minimize what this is called a circular shunt, which is backwards flow through the tricuspid valve and pulmonary valve. It's thought to be due to the ductal flow. So you would not wanna start prostaglandin in this instance versus if you know there's pulmonary atresia and it's ductal dependent, obviously you will need prostaglandin. ECMO uh, is a useful backup, um, uh, but then you need to certainly get rid of that ductus. Tetralogy with absent pulmonary valve, interesting as well. On the inside, it's got the features of regular tetralogy of the overriding aorta and the big VSD, but sweeping up towards the outflow tract, instead of seeing small pulmonary arteries, you see these giant pulmonary arteries that oftentimes look like cysts in the lungs. The pulmonary valve is there, it just doesn't work, and usually there's no ductus. And so the problem is marked pulmonary insufficiency, not so much pulmonary stenosis. Mortality is high, and interestingly, multiple studies have suggested two subgroups of patients, 
um, about 50-50, half of them having no respiratory symptoms at all, and a straightforward tetralogy clinical course that many times can be repaired electively. And then the other half that have severe respiratory distress at birth uh, with tracheobronchial malacia, even potentially lung hypoplasia or hyperexpansion with congenital lobar emphysema. So again, looking to the literature, the single retrospective studies, mortality certainly is associated with high drops in the heart not working. And uh, one study suggests uh, also with an associated, if you have associated genetic abnormalities. But interestingly, it's not the size of those branch pulmonary arteries, even though those are the most obvious thing to look at on the fetal echo. However, respiratory symptoms at birth is what predicts whether these kids are gonna do okay or not. So the big question is how can we predict respiratory symptoms at birth based on these fetal echo pictures? Um, this is a study that we've uh, put together with a, a multidisciplinary working group. And I will tell you for those who are participating, it has been submitted and it is finally in final review. Um, of 100 fetuses from 19 institutions, um, 78 with an intent to treat, uh, 9% in utero mortality. Um, and then once they were born, again, the 50-50 rule sort of happened with 53% having an elective repair because they looked good uh, in the delivery room and thereafter with a 92% survival. And then the other half being really sick and either dying without intervention or requiring some sort of emergency surgery. Uh, the fetal echo predictors of death, the size of the heart, um, moderate or severe right sided dilation or any LV dilation, um, ventricular dysfunction, and a large pulmonary valve Z score, which I think is a marker for the degree of insufficiency. But it was not the main PA. RPA or LPA size, as we've all suspected. It did, um, when you look on fetal echo, findings suggesting that the lungs are abnormal um, did in fact predict outcome. We looked at both mediastinal shift and left or right lung enlargement or compression. So now let's look at the lung. This is that same heart. We'll ignore the heart and the pulmonary arteries, which is certainly hard for us to do as cardiologists. And then you sort of look and you see this lung, it looks big, maybe bright. And this one down here, it looks maybe small or could just be compressed. Um, the MRI that we did on this patient, um, only surprising in that how easy it was to see on MRI, how abnormal that right lung was, just full of fluid, full of fluid, hyper expanded. Uh, and then this left lung was small. So we've started to use this in all the TED absent valves um, to try to restratify uh, and decide whether this is a patient that's going to be in trouble in the delivery room. So what do we do? Well, again, it's ventilation that matters. Um, some people say put them prone to pull the pulmonary arteries off the uh, trachea. I don't think that works so great. You know, when they come out and they're really sick, what you need to do, you can put them prone, but really what you need is to control their ventilation um, uh, and minimize air trapping. Um, also, trying to drop pulmonary resistance, 100% um, oxygen, and considering the use of nitric oxide, and of course, ECMO as backup. Transposition, um, this one's my favorite. We know there's an increased morbidity and mortality if the foramen and ductus are abnormal. The literature tells us things to look for on the foramen as well as the ductus to predict who's going to get into trouble. Um, the thing is, if you see these features, they're very specific for difficulties in the delivery room, but not very sensitive. So let's look. Here's transposition. Uh, obviously, the four chamber view is normal, uh, and it's the outflow tracks that give it away with the pulmonary artery coming off the LV, the aorta from the RV. But as we look at the foramen, um, here you can see this basso valis is small. The atrial septum is kind of tethered up here. It's not really moving very well. And for this particular fetus, um, we were even able to sort of document that the blood's not crossing. It's just swirling around in the right atrium. Uh, this is a hypermobile atrial septum. It suggests that the foramen uh, septum primum is tethered up here and the left atrial pressure is high, causing this to swing back and forth. 
And then here's a ductus. It measures small um, by z-score. And then this flow pattern, if you look really closely, has bidirectional flow. So this suggests that the pulmonary resistance has fallen. And all of these features suggest that this baby's uh, going to need an intervention, a balloon septostomy soon after birth. This is a case that I had as a young attending, and I apologize for the quality of this, but it was videotape. Um, uh, in my early experience, 34 weeks, the obstetrician said the fetus is having decelerations. Could you just look before we do our C-section? Uh, the heart was dilated. The atrial septum wasn't uh, open, so we had a closed foramen ovale. And then I was surprised to see transposition. Um, it had gone undiagnosed with the aorta coming off the RV, the pulmonary artery here, and there was also no ductus. So this is a closed foramen, a closed ductus. This fetus was um, 35 weeks, I think, and uh, really had a terrible heart rate tracing. So they did do a stat C-section, but we did it in our cardiac OR um, uh, with ECMO available, and we certainly needed it. The baby arrested right in the delivery room. Um, ultimately did have a switch, but unfortunately died of complications from pulmonary hypertension uh, and ECMO. I always wondered um, why, how on earth did that happen? Um, was it there all along? And so I got my answer here. This is one of my fellows who published this case of a fetus with transposition that at 23 weeks, um, you can see this open atrial septum, but it's hypermobile. And then zooming up towards the duct, this is the ductus, which already at 23 weeks was smaller than it should be and had uh, a lot of bidirectional flow, a lot of left to right flow. So certainly one that we would expect to be sick in the delivery room. But then what happened at 33 weeks is subtle, um, the right atrium started to look a little dilated. And this, even though it's open and hypermobile, seems to be tethered. Um, and maybe there's even a little bit of restriction because of the right atrial dilation. Uh, and at this point, the ductus is really hardly noticeable. It's tiny uh, and the flow pattern is very abnormal. And then what happened at 38 weeks is the foramen closed completely and more scary to me was that this heart function doesn't look normal. This left ventricle is kind of dilated. Systolic function is not normal. Um, there was monophasic mitral inflow. So definitely left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, the, the ductus was gone at this point. Um, so making us very worried. Uh, so we plan to deliver this baby um, in the uh, cath lab with the team, or in the OR with the cath team available um, to intervene. So what do we do for transposition? Um, the Rashkin balloon septostomy has been around for a while. The goal is to open the atrial septum. It can be done uh, using echo guidance. So it can be done in the delivery room, the ICU, or in the cath lab. Uh, the connection is right there. You put a balloon across. Uh, you blow up the balloon, and if you watch, it gets pulled across the atrial septum, and then the atrial septum is open. But I will say, uh, as I'm watching these babies closer and closer, is I think the ductus and the risk of uh, pulmonary hypertension is a real one. Uh, and so for those that have an abnormal ductal flow pattern or a small ductus, or in that last case, an absent ductus, um, we typically have nitric oxide on hand. Uh, to treat pulmonary hypertension. Quickly, fetal arrhythmias, the tachyarrhythmias um, certainly can cause heart failure or heart failure can lead to an arrhythmia. Uh, so it's hard to know when you have high drops what started. This is an SVT as the Doppler shows. The factors that influence outcome include um, an early gestational age at diagnosis, associated heart disease, failure to achieve sinus rhythm or rate control in utero, if you must de um, deliver prematurely, or if there's associated high drops. Um, certainly, high drops is bad, uh, develops in about 40 to 50 percent of fetuses with SVT, uh, and the mortality is near 50 percent. However, if there's successful fetal treatment, the mortality goes down. So certainly if you have an arrhythmia that's not controlled and cardiac dysfunction or high drops, 
um, this is a level three, four delivery. Uh, bradycardia is the other side. Uh, AV block is what we worry about. Uh, SSA-related AB block can also be associated with cardiac dysfunction and endocardial fibroelastosis, and then certainly congenital heart disease, in particular the heterotaxies with left atrial isomerisms, can have an associated uh, cardiomyopathy. If you look at this study here, um, it's a little old, but certainly we're not doing too much better. Um, if you have isolated heart block from SSA, there is still a significant um, mortality. Um, and then certainly if you add serious congenital heart disease, the mortality is very high. Surveillance for the SSA patient is important to look for the progression to heart block. Uh, and in addition to the PR interval um, assessments of cardiac function, including looking for EFE and effusions, as well as overall heart function is important. Um, this is a case series that we put together um, and we've subsequently published some updated information saying that maybe uh, middle cerebral artery and uh, umbilical artery flow is useful as well. Uh, but in this early work, the cardiovascular profile score, which is a 10 point score looking at five different items, um, was able to predict those um, that had heart block uh, that we're going to go on to have uh, fetal compromise. So paying close attention uh, to the heart and its function and cardiovascular status is important. Obviously, if you have um, bradycardia, heart block, and evidence of fetal compromise, um, cardiac dysfunction or high drops, that's a high-risk delivery. And then finally, these crazy rhythms. This is a patient of mine where one of my partners published. Uh, this is a case report where the heart was dilated. The heart function um, was not great. And then we've got like normal. We've got pauses. Um, we've got long pauses. Uh, and then we've got uh, what looks like ventricular tachycardia at really rapid rates. This is usually long QT, um, and certainly this terrible arrhythmia, um, you need somebody in the delivery room uh, really to figure out what to do. And so this baby was born with tersades, as you can see, uh, and lots of uh, ectopy, both atrial and ventricular. So the big question, um, how can we uh, minimize hemodynamic compromise and can we predict delivery room care? This is um, our first look at how we were doing with eight years worth of using our protocols, we were able to diagnose congenital heart disease um, reliably. There were only um, four that we um, missed, and those four had cart three of the four had cartation. We all know that cartation continues to be a pain uh, for us to diagnose uh, with false negatives and false positives, and we're working on how to do that better. But I think interestingly, looking at these in which we assigned a level of care one to four, we were pretty uh, much on target at assigning what was gonna be needed in the delivery room. But I would like to draw your attention here, which is where we're saying there's congenital heart disease that needs an intervention, but not specialized care. So you don't wanna be wrong here. We were, thank goodness, right the majority of the time. However, there were seven in which we allowed to deliver in a center with a neonatologist um, uh, with the plan to transfer for surgery. In that group of seven um, that instead needed an immediate, immediate transport, um, all of them had transposition of the great arteries. And we were initially using those protocols um, for um, uh, looking at the atrial septum to say which ones would be likely to close. And we realized very quickly after just this one that very early on that had severe acidosis, the other ones, we, uh, other six, thank goodness, we were able to stabilize at the outside delivery room. But it only took that one to make me realize that you just can't trust a transposition and they should never be in that level two category. So when we put together the HA scientific statement, uh, looking at sort of what are those fetal echo findings and what needs to happen in the delivery room, 
uh, if you look, the, the expert consensus was that even though there are things for us to look at that help us predict those kids who are going to be sick, all fetuses with transposition should be considered at risk. So you need to be prepared to intervene. So can we do better? This is where maternal hyperoxia testing comes in. I am not going to be talking about chronic maternal hyperoxia therapy. I think uh, that's a lecture in and of itself, and we have a lot to learn about the risks um, of that before we consider the benefits. Um, but we do use maternal hyperoxia testing to simulate what's going to happen in the delivery room because it should drop pulmonary resistance in the third trimester. This is what you would see in uh, high pulmonary resistance uh, at baseline and then some diastolic flow suggesting a drop in pulmonary resistance um, with the administration of oxygen to a mom. Um, this is our proof of concept paper that came out uh, two years ago now where we found it to be useful in Epstein's to say, is that valve gonna open? Total veins, is this gonna be obstructed or not? Hypoplastic left heart, um, what about that left atrial egress? Is it good enough? And then transposition, can we decide if there's gonna be pulmonary hypertension or a foramen that closes? And here's an example. This is a TGA, here's the foramen, nice and open at baseline. And with just 10 minutes of maternal oxygen, you can see there's really no flow across that foramen. So this is one that closed. We're doing uh, a prospective study through the Fetal Heart Society, hopefully to help us answer if we can use any new or different features to better predict those transposition babies who will get into trouble. Uh, this is from one of my papers for all these patients who are identified to be very high risk, the level fours. We create these kind of flow diagrams so everybody understands what needs to happen at every step along the way. And we use our performance improvement group to kind of create this, and then we talk about it as a team as to what's going to happen. So, um, we also create specialty-driven checklists where everybody gets one. The planning phase pre-launch is before the mom makes it into the delivery room. Launch is the C-section is initiated, and then we debrief with all of them. We also make OR maps for the very complicated ones. Uh, and this is, I guess, uh, in um, honor of our Super Bowl coming up. It kind of looks like a football play to me with everybody moving around. You go left, you go right. And then what happens as the baby leaves? And so if you're not an avatar uh, on this OR map, you should not be in the operating room. So what if we can't be there? Uh, and this is uh, our latest work. Um, this is hot off the press. It's uh, currently online um, and hopefully uh, will be out soon uh, for reading um, to look at standardized delivery room management um, for neonates, a model for improving interdisciplinary care. Um, so the DR recommendations uh, for our neonatologists um, are kind of summarized here really pretty much if the diagnosis is made, what do we need to think about? Planned intubation, oxygen, good or bad? What about sedation and neuromuscular blockade? Um, if you have your cardiologist uh, in the delivery room, is an echo useful? Prostaglandin, yes, no. And what about line placement? So we kind of go through each diagnosis uh, and try to figure out what kind of protocol that we can put in place. Um, we then created these delivery checklists for neonatologists for um, each of these high-risk diagnoses. Uh, and it's been fun because our neonatologists have printed them and posted them in the delivery room to use. Here's an example of one of them. This is the transposition delivery protocol, which tells us the stepwise of what to do, intubate, what fats to look for, do you use sedation and neuromuscular blockade, prostaglandin, um, you know, and as we talked about, inhaled nitric oxide, when to use it. Um, and then what we did, the neonatologist asked us for this, just a little tiny quick summary of what the problem is. Um, you know, why are these kids sick? So we put down a little physiology lesson at the bottom of each one of these protocols. Um, finally, how about delivery considerations for obstetricians? There's no data to support the benefit of a C-section versus a vaginal delivery. So when 
uh, when you can, vaginal delivery is better. As far as fetal monitoring goes, there's no data to support additional monitoring beyond what's standard. Um, as far as delivery timing, I think we all know this now is 39 plus weeks is better uh, for outcomes. It seems to be the sweet spot according to the STS database, as well as other studies that have looked at outcome based on gestational age. Uh, what about it? Again, and so I'm going to circle back. Can we improve outcomes? Um, so this is our work uh, in identifying these high-risk patients with various diseases. Uh, they all seem to need what uh, we said they needed. Uh, what I think is important is we got them all out of the delivery room, and despite the terrible diagnoses, 83% survived to discharge. If we look at how they showed up in our um, ICU, they got there more quickly. If you look at the time difference here um, and their oxygen level was better. In the Toronto study, looking at the prenatal group um, that were ductal dependent, those diagnosed prenatally, um, got admitted quicker, had surgery earlier, uh, had a better lactate, uh, were less likely to be ventilated or need uh, vasoactive medicines, uh, and less likely to have a cardiac arrest before surgery, uh, and we're more likely to survive. So uh, fetal diagnosis does seem to make a difference. So with that, I'm going to end. Um, I do think we can improve outcomes with a fetal diagnosis, but it goes beyond just making the diagnosis. We have to understand the circulation, both in utero and during transition, uh, and then we need to make a plan for DR uh, and postnatal care. And obviously, we need to work together uh, with the neonatologists as well as our obstetrical colleagues and even our cardiac specialists, the ICU team, the heart failure team, the electrophysiologists, and our interventionalists. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful. Uh, presentation on congenital heart disease and how we need to use it and use the guidance that you guys can give us beforehand and in new ways we're learning to um, prognosticate a little bit better, or at least know what equipment we need to have ready in the delivery room. Um, with the the call that you have coming out shortly, uh, are those little um, card snippets involved for the the big diagnoses, that, like the example you'd given for TGA? Yeah, I mean, we put, we put together, put together um, uh, oops, do I have to do I have something? To do something? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, still? I can hear you. Yeah, I just feel I like there's feel like <laughs> So I'm not sure what I have to mute, if anything. Um, yeah, I mean, we put it together for those diagnoses I listed. Um, you know, I think we may even try to think about some of the simpler ones, like, you know, the straightforward ductal dependent lesions. But for the diagnoses that we listed, you know, transposition, hypoplast, particularly if we're worried about the atrial septum, uh, TED absent valve, Epstein's. Um, total veins, uh, and then tachycardia, bradycardia, and heart failure. Um, what we were finding is that, you know, we coordinate and plan these deliveries, um, and we try to be there for the deliveries, and in the extreme cases, we deliver by C-section, very rarely at our children's hospital. And for those of you who do this for a living, it seems like uh, at least 25% of the time, the baby delivers like two days before the plan. Um, and so what we thought we would do would be to put together something that said, um, if we were there, what would we want to happen? Um, and sort of use the expertise of our neonatologists, our cardiac intensivists, um, uh, and everyone involved to say, how is this different than the standard neonatal resuscitation. Like, first off, you have to do the neonatal resuscitation airway, airway, right? Um, but then, and obviously, if you're asystolic, you need to do chest compression. So, like, the basics apply. But once you get past that, what special needs to happen? 
Uh, and so that's what we created um, for the neonatologists that we work with very frequently. Uh, and it gives them that reassurance that um, they know what to do initially um, to stabilize things. Uh, the, the end point is always move as quickly as possible to the you know, tertiary care center or the center, you know, wherever the procedure needs to happen. But what can you do to minimize the hypoxia and the compromise? Um, so yeah, as part of that, um, that article, the supplements will be um, exactly what I showed you. So we're hoping to maybe put that together as a big QI project that maybe even can be a national effort to say, you know, when we inst institute these things, can we make a difference? Yes, it seems like a wonderful resource to have on hand, particularly because they never do follow the plan. <laughs> in terms of delivery, they always come at the different day before, after, take longer for their induction. So sometimes uh, all the people that have been there uh, and part of the planning are not always there in the moment. And so it's nice to have a little thing in the background. What have you found through the course of your time um, working on delivery room management and, and transition from fetal to extra uterine life for these neonates to be the most important, especially if it's a potentially um, unknown diagnosis for someone who ends up deliver not making it into their planned location. So they deliver out in the region because they can't make it, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes in. Um, if you're doing some sort of med command by the phone to an outside hospital, what are your best um, strategies and tips besides get the baby there as fast as you can? Right. And actually, I think um, these uh, protocols that we put together is exactly what you need to do. Um, and uh, Pretty much, we're using. We're going to demo them at you know the main hospital we deliver is right across the street, but our um, neonatologists actually run the NICUs of at least four or five different hospitals that are in our region. Some are further away than others. I think the furthest one away is like 60 miles, um, and so we're going to demo them in that those um, neonatology units. But I think. Uh, if you get a call and somebody knew that it was a diagnosis of something, transposition or whatever, it's obvious that the balloon can't be done um, at that hospital. There's no cardiologist there. And so following these protocols, I think, is useful. Um, what I've learned mostly um, from my cardiac intensivist is that if you can't, you know, fix the PO2, what you have to do is minimize oxygen consumption. So one of the first things to do, you know, in a baby who's hypoxic um, and has decreased cardiac output is to, you know, intubate them, sedate them, uh, paralyze them, which I think is not the, you know, next step a lot of times for the neonatologist. But I've learned from my intensivist that if you truly have a very hypoxic baby that's acidotic, you have to take away all that work um, by getting control of, you know, breathing, ventilation, um, you know, trying to, it, you know, maximize oxygenation the best you can, you know, using oxygen, considering nitric if PVR is a problem, but really um, not having these kids flailing around. Um, you really need to, to control it. I'm not saying that every baby with condoned heart disease should be intubated and paralyzed. Absolutely not. So the ductal dependent defects, um, if you use low dose prostaglandin, don't even need to be intubated. But if you're dealing with an acidotic hypoxic kid, um, I think that's a good first step. Um, using volume resuscitation is important and trying to be very smart on, you know, do you want to use a lot of epinephrine because you know that's going to, again, increase maybe the heart rate and the metabolic demand. So there's, you know, give volume, um, fix the acidosis, uh, control ventilation, uh, and really move as fast as you can is almost the common theme. 
Um, and, you know, I think that all of us need to work together. I mean, certainly when we have a baby that we know what the diagnosis is, we are on the phone with them through the whole process. And they're telling us what the blood pressure is, what the oxygen level is, um, what the gas is, you know, and then we sort of work together to figure out how we can use our cardiac intensive care um, kind of expertise to help. Wonderful. I think all of those are great um, points and, and things to keep in mind when you can't always be present. Although now with a lot of the electronics, especially since COVID has made everyone a little bit more virtually savvy, I think. Yeah. So yeah. maybe a little bit easier to uh, do some virtual um, management if, if we're working with hospitals that are sort of either affiliated or come to us for expertise, but are not places that we staff and we're trying to remotely walk them right. through resuscitation right. that may be more complex than usual. Another um, common theme of some questions that have come up um, that I have seen are, are, are there ways um, that um, patients that we didn't really talk much about the ones that have fetal interventions done because I know that's its own whole side thing, but um, the, the planning and care of those patients after they've had a fetal intervention, um, particularly for aortic stenosis or um, some sort of left-sided outflow obstructions that should be taken uh, differently or just followed through the hypoplastic left heart algorithm? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good question. And I think, you know, once the intervention is done, um, the assessment of cardiovascular status has to start over, right? So, um, you know, if the aortic valve is ballooned um, and it works uh, and the left ventricle is not permanently injured, you'll end up with a baby that probably has aortic stenosis and maybe some mitral valve disease plus or minus a coarctation. Um, so you need to then revert back to what fetal echo features help me determine whether this is ductal dependent or not. Um, and then initiate prostaglandin if you know there's reverse flow across the atrial septum or in the aortic arch. Um, and certainly if it doesn't sort of work in that the left ventricle is tiny and uh, echo bright, then it's the same. It's the management of hypoplastic left heart. I think the more interesting one is when you, when uh, the intervention is on the atrial septum, um, because those are the ones where, you know, if the atrial septum is opened um, and stays open, which is important, um, then it's very possible that that then goes down to what we call the level two delivery, which is initiate prostaglandin, treat it like a regular hypoplast, versus if that atrial septum closes back off, then it's back to the, we need to do something more aggressive. Um, and the uh, International Fetal Registry um, looking at so far the the interventions on the atrial septum have kind of shown that the long-term out the outcome of those patients is no different but interestingly their delivery room care is so that if the atrial septum is open then you don't have to go through the c-section coordinated go to the cath lab um, but you do need to confirm that the atrial septum is open and the pulmonary vein flow is normal or not the pattern that suggests that the atrial septum needs to be open. I think what I didn't talk about, the other thing is that with the atrial septum is the long-term effects on the lungs. Uh, and so using MRI to look at like the, the pattern that's called nutmeg lung, which suggests permanent injury um, uh, to the lungs uh, is, associated with a very poor outcome, uh, even if you open the atrial septum. So um, knowing that this is going to be a really high risk delivery with potential lung abnormalities has to put in, be put into play in that regard. 
Thank you all very insightful. Um, one last for anyone that may be um, at the point where they are feeling like they need to introduce levels of care or um, kind of coordinated efforts to do this beforehand. Obviously, there's a lot of details that go into that, but some of the pearls uh, or words of wisdom you have for, for groups that may need to start um, aiding care and, and designating high-risk patients. Oh, words of wisdom. So I think that, you know, those of us who are fetal cardiologists are really starting to understand our patients. Um, and you really do have to look at the physiology. Um, and my, I guess one of my uh, pieces of, uh, of, I guess, knowledge from experience is the fetus does change. Um, so you can't be reassured on the 20 week scan or unfortunately even the 30 week scan um, that for these potentially high risk fetuses, you have to look right at the end at somewhere around 36, 37 weeks um, because the, the you know, atrial septum can get smaller, the ductus can get smaller. Um, you can be surprised what can happen at the very end of pregnancy. So I think it's important to make your plans based on a uh, late third trimester uh, study. Um, you know, I think that we should try for vaginal deliveries whenever we can. So, you know, certainly um, I think most of our patients can be delivered, you know, somewhere where there's neonatology presence, um, but that small number of patients um, that fall into very specific subgroups I think, you know, it's important to look at these hemodynamic features um, to then sort of change that plan of care, um, you know, right at as you approach the end of pregnancy. So I think that's perhaps the most important thing um, is to realize that the fetus is forever changing and you need to kind of pay attention in the end. I think it's also important just to try to work as a team. Um, and hear what everybody has to say to, as you kind of put together these protocols um, for the management of these patients um, uh, in the delivery room. Thank you. It looks like we have reached um, the end of our time for this afternoon. And again, I appreciate so much you taking part of your time out to talk with us about fetal cardiology and delivery room management. And I thank everyone for joining us today. And we will um, see everyone again next month. And um, questions can always be directed uh, to Jacqueline Ward, who sent out the invite. And um, stay safe and healthy. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me.